In a secluded, wind-battered house on the edge of a cliff, Joseph Grant settled in for a solitary evening. The remote coastal town below was silent as the tide lapped against the rocks far below, the churning water barely visible in the sliver of moonlight above. Despite the isolation, Joseph was an old hand at spending nights alone in eerie places. He prided himself on his resilience. But tonight was different. There was something unsettling in the air, a weight, as if he were being watched by something ancient. The house had been empty for over a decade. Locals avoided it, and its reputation as haunted only added to its abandonment. Stories told of strange noises in the dead of night, mysterious lights flickering in windows, and shadows moving without explanation. But for Joseph, the tales were nothing more than superstitions, mere stories that intrigued him. He was here because he wanted to prove to himself and others that there was nothing to fear. Joseph settled into the dusty armchair near the fireplace, his flashlight casting long shadows across the room as he skimmed through a book. Outside, the wind howled, and the house seemed to creak and groan in response, as if alive. It was nearing midnight when he first heard it, a faint scratching at the window. He dismissed it as the wind, perhaps a stray branch brushing against the pane. But as the minutes passed, the scratching grew louder, more insistent. Reluctantly, Joseph stood up and shined his flashlight towards the window. Nothing but the desolate landscape greeted him. He returned to his chair, shaking off a slight chill that had crept into his bones. He turned back to his book, but the words now seemed jumbled and distant, his mind distracted by the unease settling around him. The scratching returned, this time louder, sharper, almost urgent. His breath caught as he looked back to the window. Against the pale moonlight, a silhouette pressed against the glass. It was a human shape, distorted by the fog and grime, but unmistakably real. Heart pounding, Joseph approached the window, gripping his flashlight like a weapon. But as he got closer, the figure vanished, leaving nothing but the dark, empty landscape. He stood there for several moments, staring into the darkness, his heart racing. It was just his mind playing tricks, he told himself. An overactive imagination fueled by the eerie setting. Determined to shake off his nerves, he closed the curtains and returned to his chair. But as he settled back down, he felt a strange sensation, a prickling at the back of his neck, as if someone were standing behind him, watching. He forced himself to ignore it, focusing on his book and trying to push away the growing fear gnawing at his mind. It was close to 1 a.m. when the silence was shattered by a loud bang from upstairs. He jumped, the book slipping from his hands. Every muscle in his body tensed as he listened, straining to hear any further sound. But there was only silence, heavy, suffocating silence. Taking a deep breath, Joseph climbed the creaky staircase, his flashlight trembling in his hand. The second floor was cold, much colder than it had been downstairs, and the chill seemed to seep into his bones. He moved down the hallway, his footsteps echoing through the empty rooms. Each door he passed felt like a gateway to something darker, as if the house itself were alive and waiting. Finally, he reached the end of the hall, where a single door stood ajar. He pushed it open, his flashlight illuminating the room beyond. It was empty, bare except for an old mirror hanging on the wall. The glass was clouded and cracked, reflecting a twisted, distorted version of the room back at him. As he stepped closer, he caught a glimpse of movement in the reflection, something dark and shadowy lingering just out of sight. He whipped around, but there was nothing there. His heart raced as he turned back to the mirror. The shadow was still there, hovering behind him, growing darker, more defined. He could make out the shape of a face, pale and hollow, eyes staring directly into his. Panicking, Joseph stumbled back, tripping over the edge of a rug and falling hard onto the floor. The flashlight rolled out of his hand, casting a skewed beam of light that illuminated the room in strange, flickering shadows. As he struggled to his feet, he heard a voice, a low, whispering voice that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere all at once. Joseph, you shouldn't be here. The words echoed through the room, chilling him to the core. He scanned the darkness, his heart pounding in his chest. But there was no one there. The room was empty, yet the voice seemed to linger, filling the air with an oppressive weight. Desperate to escape, Joseph scrambled down the stairs, not daring to look back. As he reached the bottom, the front door slammed shut, trapping him inside. His flashlight flickered and died, plunging him into darkness. He fumbled for his phone, 
but it was dead, the screen lifeless and unresponsive. A chill crept over him, and he realized that the air had grown impossibly cold. His breath came out in visible puffs, and a thick, suffocating silence filled the house. In the darkness, he heard the sound of footsteps, slow, deliberate footsteps approaching from the hallway. Panic gripped him as the footsteps drew closer, their sound echoing through the empty rooms. He pressed himself against the wall, his heart racing, his mind racing with fear. The footsteps stopped just outside the doorway, and he felt the presence again, that same cold, watching presence he had felt before. And then, in the darkness, a face appeared, pale, hollow-eyed, with a twisted, malevolent smile that seemed to stretch far beyond the edges of reality. It was the same face he had seen in the mirror, but now it was real, standing inches away, staring directly into his soul. Leave, or stay forever, the voice whispered, sending a shiver down his spine. Joseph stumbled backward, his hands searching desperately for something, anything, to defend himself. But there was nothing, only the suffocating darkness and the pale, ghostly figure that seemed to grow closer with every passing second. In a final act of desperation, Joseph ran to the window, throwing it open and leaping into the cold night air. He landed hard, his body aching as he scrambled to his feet and ran, not daring to look back. As he reached the edge of the cliff, he glanced over his shoulder, expecting to see the figure looming behind him. But the house stood silent and empty, the windows dark and lifeless. Yet in the faint glow of the moonlight, he could still see the face, the pale, hollow-eyed face staring out from the upstairs window, watching him, waiting for him to return. Joseph never went back to that house, but the memory of that night haunted him for the rest of his life. And sometimes in the dead of night, he could still hear the voice whispering his name, calling him back to the darkness. Story number two. When the world slips into a quiet so deep it chills the soul, strange things happen. That was something I learned too well one summer, back when my family and I rented an old house near a small town in the countryside. It was one of those houses that looked pleasant in daylight, but seemed to transform as soon as night fell. Uh, a house that hid secrets in its bones, waiting for the right time to let them out. It started innocently enough. My little brother Sam and I had just settled in with our parents. We spent our days exploring the woods, fishing in the nearby lake and staying up late on the back porch, listening to the crickets and telling spooky stories. But our tales were nothing compared to what was lurking in that house. It was a week into our stay when I first noticed the sounds. It was well past midnight, the house silent except for the soft creak of old wood. I was lying in bed, struggling to fall asleep when I heard it, footsteps on the staircase. Slow, deliberate, each step heavier than the last. My bedroom was right at the top of the stairs, and the closer the sound got, the colder my room became. I pulled my blanket over my head, convinced it was just my imagination. But the footsteps didn't stop. They halted, just outside my door, and then silence. Heart pounding, I peeked out from under the blanket, staring at the shadow under the door. There was nothing there, no shadow of feet, no one standing in the hall. I must have lain there for hours, wide awake, listening for any sound, but nothing else came. The next morning, I told my mom about the footsteps, but she just brushed it off. Old houses make noise, sweetheart, she said, ruffling my hair. But I knew what I'd heard. Sam, usually my partner in crime for anything creepy, laughed it off, teasing me for letting my imagination get the best of me. That night, though, things escalated. As I lay in bed, the footsteps returned, but this time they didn't stop outside my door. Instead, they continued down the hallway, right to Sam's room. I held my breath, straining to hear, but all I caught was a faint murmur, like someone whispering on the other side of a thin wall. The words were muffled, unclear, but the tone was pleading, desperate. I crept out of bed and tiptoed down the hall to Sam's room. His door was open and he was lying in bed, his eyes wide open, staring at something near his window. When I glanced over, I froze. There in the dim light was a figure, a shadow, tall and thin, with arms that seemed too long and fingers that brushed against the floor. Its face was hidden in darkness, but I could feel its gaze, cold and heavy, fixed on Sam. Neither of us dared to move, and then, as if noticing me, it turned its head slowly, tilting it at an unnatural angle. I felt rooted to the spot, every instinct screaming for me to run, but I couldn't tear my eyes away. Leave, I whispered, my voice barely a breath. 
For a moment, the shadow seemed to hesitate. Then, in one swift fluid motion, it slipped through the wall, vanishing into the darkness. Sam and I sat there in silence, neither of us knowing what to say. Over the next few nights, the figure returned again and again. Each time, it lingered a bit longer, and each time it seemed to grow closer, as if studying us, trying to learn something. The whispers grew louder, and though we couldn't understand the words, we felt their weight pressing on us, filling the room with dread. One night, I woke to find Sam standing at the top of the staircase, his face blank, eyes unseeing. He was sleepwalking, something he'd never done before. I ran to him, shaking his shoulder, calling his name. It took a moment, but finally he blinked, snapping back to himself. He looked at me, confused, and whispered, I dreamed it was calling me down to the, the cellar. The cellar. We'd never been down there. The door to the cellar was always locked, a rusty padlock hanging from its handle, and our parents had warned us to stay away. But now I felt an irresistible pull to go down there, as if the answer to this nightmare was buried in the darkness below. The next day, when our parents went into town, I convinced Sam to come with me. We found the old key hanging in the kitchen and unlocked the padlock. The cellar door creaked open, revealing a narrow staircase that descended into pitch black darkness. Armed with flashlights, we stepped inside, the air thick and stale, filled with the scent of damp earth. At the bottom, the cellar was small and empty, with only a few crates stacked in a corner. But in the center of the room was something chilling, a small handmade wooden box. It looked ancient, covered in dust, its lid carved with strange symbols. Sam reached for it, his hand trembling, but I stopped him. Instead, I opened the box myself. Inside were old photographs, worn and faded, of a family, parents and a young girl, smiling happily. But as I flipped through, the last photo sent a chill through me. It showed the girl alone, standing by the lake, her expression hauntingly sad. Just then, a cold breeze swept through the cellar, and I heard a faint voice, no longer a whisper, but a clear, agonized plea. Help me. Sam grabbed my arm, his face pale. We need to leave, he stammered. I stuffed the photo back in the box, and we ran up the stairs, slamming the cellar door behind us. That night was our last in the house. I could feel her, whoever she was, whatever had happened to her, her presence, more desperate than ever. But she never hurt us. It was almost as if she was trapped, unable to move on until someone acknowledged her suffering. Before leaving, I took the photograph and buried it near the lake, hoping it would bring her peace. To this day, I don't know who she was or what happened to her. But in the dead of night, when silence falls like a shroud, I sometimes feel that same chill. And in those quiet hours, I wonder if she finally found the rest she deserved, or if she still wanders, waiting for someone to hear her cries. Story number three. Twelve-year-old Zara's friends whispered stories about an abandoned house at the edge of the village, a place where even adults feared to tread after sunset. No one dared go near it, especially in the dead of night. Some said the ghost of a woman haunted it, a figure in white, waiting for anyone foolish enough to step inside. Her friends teased Zara relentlessly. You're too scared, aren't you? Rafi smirked. I bet you can't even spend ten minutes inside that house, added Priya. Zara felt her pride prickling. She wasn't one to back down from a challenge. Fine, she said. I'll do it. Just wait by the gate, and you'll see. That night, the air was cold and heavy, as if nature itself was warning against the visit. Zara stood before the iron gate, her heart racing. Rafi, Priya, and two other friends watched from the street, their nervous giggles fading as Zara pushed open the gate with a groan. The house loomed ahead, its windows darkened sockets, and the cracked walls seemed to sag under years of neglect. Only ten minutes, Zara whispered to herself, clenching her fists to keep them from trembling. With her friend's hushed voices at her back, Zara stepped into the house. The old wooden door swung open with a reluctant creak, and the air inside was stale, like forgotten memories trapped in dust. Moonlight slipped in through the cracked windows, casting pale beams across the floor. The first room was empty, just a rotting sofa and some cobwebbed furniture. Zara felt a bit more confident. This isn't so bad, she muttered, her breath misting in the cold. Then a faint noise stopped her. It was the sound of footsteps. Her heart stumbled. For a moment, she stood frozen, straining to listen. The house had been abandoned for decades. There shouldn't have been anyone inside. She convinced herself it was just the house settling. Old wood creaked, right? She took another step, 
and that's when she heard it again. Tap, tap, tap. The sound was coming from upstairs. The rhythmic tapping was too deliberate, too precise to be an accident. Zara's skin prickled, and she could feel the cold creeping into her bones. But she refused to back down now. She had something to prove. Taking a deep breath, she climbed the staircase, each step groaning under her weight. At the top, a long hallway stretched before her, its doors half open like silent invitations. The tapping noise had stopped, but now Zara felt a presence, something watching her. Her gaze drifted to the end of the hallway. A door stood slightly ajar, and a dim light flickered beyond it as if someone had lit a candle. Zara hesitated. The smart thing would be to turn around, run downstairs, and get out of the house. But something pulled her toward that door, a strange pull like she was being drawn toward it. She inched closer, her hand trembling as she pushed the door open. Inside, the room was strangely untouched by time. A single chair stood in the middle, and a figure sat in it, back turned to Zara. The figure wore a white dress, the fabric hanging loose and lifeless over bony shoulders. Long, black hair cascaded down, obscuring the face. Zara's breath caught in her throat. The air felt thick with dread, and a chill washed over her. As if her very soul knew she had crossed the line, the figure began to hum, a slow, haunting melody that echoed through the room. Zara took a step back, her heart pounding so hard she thought it might burst. Then the figure spoke, without turning around. You shouldn't have come here. The voice was a rasp, like dry leaves scraping across stone. Zara felt her knees buckle as fear gripped her. Every instinct screamed for her to run, but her feet were rooted to the spot. Slowly, the figure began to rise from the chair, moving with unnatural slowness. Zara knew she couldn't wait to see the face beneath that curtain of hair. She turned and bolted, her feet pounding against the wooden floor. The humming followed her, growing louder, almost inside her ears, as if the very walls were singing along. She stumbled down the stairs, nearly falling, but she didn't stop. The front door was in sight, and Zara threw herself toward it. She grabbed the handle and pulled. It wouldn't budge. No, 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 she whimpered, yanking with all her strength. The humming behind her grew louder, closer. Zara dared not turn around, but she could feel the presence. Right there, just inches away, breathing down her neck. The door rattled, as if something on the other side wanted to let her out. With a final desperate pull, the door gave way, and she burst out into the night air, gasping for breath. Her friends ran to her, the f their faces pale with fear. What happened? Rafi asked, his voice shaky. I, I saw her, Zara whispered, trembling. The group stared at her in silence, fear spreading among them. Zara turned back toward the house, expecting to see that pale figure at the window. But the windows were empty, and the house stood as silent and dark as before. Let's get out of here, Priya urged. They ran, not daring to look back until they reached the safety of their homes. That night, Zara couldn't sleep. She lay awake in her bed, the events of the evening looping in her mind like a broken record. Just as she began to drift off, a sound pulled her back to consciousness. A soft, familiar sound. Tap! Her heart stopped. It was the same tapping noise she'd heard in the house, but this time it was coming from inside her room. Zara's breath hitched as she slowly turned her head toward the source. In the darkness, by the window, stood the figure in white. You shouldn't have left, it whispered. The figure stepped forward, its pale face now visible, empty black sockets where eyes should have been, and a mouth stretched into a hollow grin. Zara tried to scream, but no sound came out. The last thing she heard was the hum, soft and haunting, lulling her into the dead of night. Story number four. It was a frigid October night when Emily, fresh out of college, decided to take a spontaneous road trip through the countryside. She needed a break from the bustle of city life and had always been drawn to stories of old, mysterious towns with histories steeped in legend. Her destination was Ashford Hollow, a small village that sat in the shadow of the Blue Ridge Mountains, known among locals as the dead of night for reasons that had slipped into lore, whispered and passed down over generations. As dusk fell, Emily's car rolled through thick fog that seemed to weave between the trees like ghostly tendrils. By the time she reached Ashford Hollow, darkness had swallowed the village whole. There were no street lights, no signs of life. The only indication of the town was an old hand-carved sign hanging by a chain, creaking as the wind swept over it. The inn was her only option for the night, 
but something about the place felt wrong, even from the outside. It was a weathered, sagging Victorian mansion, with most of its windows dark, save for one, casting an eerie, flickering glow onto the lawn. The sight sent a shiver down Emily's spine, but she reasoned it was nothing more than nerves. After all, old buildings had character, and this one certainly seemed to have it in spades. When Emily entered, she was greeted by a quiet, aged woman who introduced herself as Mrs. Mays Greer. Her skin seemed translucent in the dim lighting, and her voice was almost too soft, barely rising above the ticking of a dusty grandfather clock in the corner. Room 7, Mrs. Greer said, handing over a heavy iron key. Her fingers lingered on it for just a moment too long. Upstairs, end of the hall. And do be sure to stay in your room once you retire. Some of the residents get restless at night. Emily laughed nervously, assuming it was just a quaint attempt at humor. But Mrs. Greer did not smile. Her expression remained stone cold, as though she had issued a warning, not a joke. The room was small but comfortable, with a four-poster bed and a large mirror opposite it. The walls were lined with dark, floral wallpaper, and a single gas lamp flickered on the nightstand. Exhausted from the long drive, Emily decided to unpack and settle in. As she unpacked her things, she noticed the faint scent of smoke lingering in the air, sly, though no fire was visible. She lay down, planning to get a good night's sleep, but as midnight approached, the air grew colder, and a strange, oppressive silence filled the room. Suddenly, a soft, dragging sound echoed from the hallway, like feet shuffling slowly across the floorboards. Her heart quickened as she listened to the sound growing closer, inching toward her room, halting right outside her door. Emily held her breath, straining her ears in the silence. The clock downstairs chimed twelve times, each chime echoing louder than the last. She dared to peek through the keyhole, but all she saw was darkness, thick and unmoving. Relieved but unnerved, she climbed back into bed, telling herself it was just an old house creaking with age. Yet, just as she closed her eyes, a faint voice broke the silence. Emily. Her blood ran cold. She had told no one her name. The whisper was soft, almost childlike, and seemed to drift from every corner of the room at once. She scanned the room, feeling a creeping terror wash over her as the mirror across from her bed caught her eye. In the reflection, she saw movement. A pale, thin figure standing behind her, its hollow, unblinking eyes fixated on her. Paralyzed with fear, she could do nothing but stare as it slowly lifted a hand and pointed toward her. Suddenly, her light flickered and went out plunging the room into darkness. Heart racing, Emily fumbled for her phone, but it was dead. The silence was replaced by the sound of ragged breathing, a noise that grew louder with each passing second until it was right beside her. Summoning all her courage, she bolted from the bed, gripping her key as she threw open the door and sprinted into the hallway. But the hall was different now, much longer, with dozens of doors stretching out before her, twisting and turning in impossible directions. She ran, her footsteps echoing as the hallway seemed to stretch infinitely. Shadows danced at the edge of her vision, faces half-formed, staring as she ran by. Finally, she stumbled upon the staircase and ran down, hoping to find Mrs. Greer. But as she entered the lobby, she froze. The space was filled with people, at least what was left of them. Pale, hollow-eyed figures stood in silence, their faces twisted into expressions of eternal sorrow. Each face was a story of tragedy etched in time, people who had entered Ashford Hollow and never left. At the center of the room stood Mrs. Greer, her face even paler than before, her eyes like two empty wells. She stepped toward Emily, her footsteps impossibly slow, deliberate. Emily, she whispered, I warned you to stay in your room. Now you're one of us. Before Emily could react, the figures began to close in, their bony hands reaching out, pulling her down into their endless, silent sorrow. She screamed, but no sound escaped her lips. The last thing she saw was Mrs. Greer's face, calm and sad, as though mourning her fate. The next morning, a passerby found the old inn eerily empty. The rooms were coated in a thick layer of dust, the air heavy with a stench of decay and smoke. Room 7 was vacant, except for an old, cracked mirror that faced the bed, forever reflecting a new, empty-eyed figure trapped within. To this day... Travelers report seeing a dim light in that room late at night, catching glimpses of Emily's face staring back at them from the mirror, forever trying to escape Ashford Hollow. Story number five. It was the dead of night when Emma first heard, heard the scraping sounds in her apartment. The city outside was still, shrouded in a rare quiet that was both comforting and unsettling. 
She sat up, straining her ears, listening. The noise was faint but unmistakable, a steady scratching, like nails dragging across wood coming from somewhere deep within the walls. Uh, she tried to dismiss it, convincing herself it was probably a mouse or a loose pipe. After all, she'd only recently moved into the old apartment, and she hadn't noticed any other strange signs. But the next night, as she lay curled up in bed, the noise returned, louder and closer. It sounded as if it was moving, tracing a path along her bedroom wall, stopping every so often, only to resume a few moments later. Emma's unease grew, and sleep became nearly impossible. She told her friend Julia about it, hoping for a rational explanation. Old places make sounds, Emma, Julia said. The walls settle, floors creak, you're just psyching yourself out. I bet if you ignore it, it'll stop. Emma took the advice, but it didn't help. The sounds persisted, every night around 3 a.m., always that slow, methodical scratching that seemed to echo within the walls. It got so intense one night that she couldn't bear it anymore. She got out of bed, grabbed her flashlight, and started tapping along the wall, trying to find any hollow spots, any sign of rodents or loose wood. She heard nothing, until she switched off the flashlight. The scratching began again, only now it was joined by something else, a whisper, faint and hissing, too quiet to make ache out, but undeniably there. Goosebumps rose along her arms as she leaned closer, pressing her ear to the wall. Don't ignore me, the whisper croaked, as clear as if someone were on the other side of the wall, speaking directly to her. Emma jumped back, her heart racing. She stumbled away from the wall, her mind reeling. She knew it wasn't possible. No one could be on the other side. That wall bordered a narrow alleyway with nothing but brick on the other side. But the voice continued, persistent and desperate. You can't ignore me. Emma spent the next few days in a haze, trying to convince herself that she'd, she'd just been dreaming. She barely slept, clutching a flashlight and leaving every light in her room on. But every night, the sound returned, growing louder, more agitated, until it was almost like someone was clawing their way through the wall. She couldn't take it anymore. On the fourth night, she called Julia in a panic, begging her to come over. Julia arrived, skeptical but supportive, and together they sat in the bedroom, waiting. Midnight passed, then one, then two, and just as the clock struck three, the scratching began. Julia's face went pale as she heard it too, a rhythmic scrape that traveled from one end of the room to the other, and then came the whisper, thick with sorrow and malice. Emma. Both of them froze, staring at the wall. Julia jumped up, visibly shaken. This, this isn't normal. We need to get out of here. Emma, terrified but unwilling to leave her apartment, shook her head. No, there has to be some explanation. Maybe someone lived here before, and... But before she could finish, the whisper grew louder, turning into a soft, manic laughter that echoed from every corner of the room. Julia grabbed her arm and dragged her into the hallway, slamming the door behind them. They barely slept, spending the rest of the night in the living room, huddled on the couch. The next morning, they decided to do some research on the building. It didn't take long before they found something. A news article from five years prior about a woman named Lila, who'd lived in that very apartment. The story was tragic and haunting. Lila had been a recluse with few friends and family. She'd fallen on hard times, and after losing her job, she was evicted. She had tried reaching out for help, but no one had answered her calls. According to the article, she died alone in her apartment, her, and her body had been undiscovered for weeks. Emma felt a chill settle over her as she read Lila's story, understanding for the first time the weight of the sorrow that hung over her apartment. She realized that the whisper in the walls wasn't just a ghostly presence. It was a soul trapped by the pain of abandonment, crying out for someone to acknowledge her existence. That night, Emma prepared herself. She stayed up, braving the inevitable scratching and whispers, determined to listen this time. At exactly 3 a.m., the scratching returned, followed by that familiar whisper. Emma. Emma gathered her courage and whispered back. Lila, I hear you. I'm here. The scratching stopped instantly. The room grew deathly still, the air heavy with tension. Then, for the first time, the whisper came through clearly, words tinged with sadness and relief. Thank you. The room grew cold, and for a brief moment, Emma felt a soft hand on her shoulder, a gentle, grateful touch. She held her breath, hoping Lila had found the peace she needed. After that night, the apartment was quiet. No more scratching, no more whispers. Emma slept peacefully, 
free from the weight that had hung over the place for so long. She never told anyone else about the experience, not wanting to risk disturbing Lila's rest. But sometimes in the dead of night when the city grew still, she would feel a soft breeze pass through the room, as if someone were watching over her just to say, Story number six. The storm began just as Faison turned onto the narrow, forest-lined road leading to his grandmother's old house. The place had been abandoned for years, but after she passed, it became his responsibility to inspect it and decide if it was worth renovating. Thunder rumbled overhead and rain lashed against the windshield. His phone had no signal and the GPS stopped working hours ago. Only the headlights of his car pierced through the thick curtain of rain. The road stretched endlessly, shrouded by a darkness that seemed heavier than any night he had known. When the old house finally appeared at the edge of the forest, Faison felt an unexpected chill. He hadn't visited since childhood, and the memories that drifted back were, were strange. Faint images of cold halls, distant whispers, and sleepless nights. As a child, he'd always thought the house was haunted, but those were just the fantasies of a scared little boy. Or so, he convinced himself. He pulled into the driveway, parked, and stepped out into the rain. The house stood like a relic from another time, its wooden walls sagging, windows clouded with grime, and the front porch sagging under years of neglect. The air smelled of wet earth and rotting wood. Faison retrieved a flashlight from the car, flicked it on, and made his way to the front door. The key still fit, though the lock resisted for a moment before clicking open with a reluctant snap. The door swung inward with a groan, revealing the dark interior beyond. The air inside was damp, thick with the scent of mildew and abandonment. Faison's footsteps echoed as he walked through the front hall, shining the flashlight across dusty furniture draped in white sheets. The place seemed untouched, frozen in time. He wandered deeper into the house, the sound of rain hammering on the roof overhead. The silence inside was unsettling, broken only by the occasional creak of the old wooden floor. As he reached the living room, Faison spotted something strange. A rocking chair, swaying ever so slightly as if someone had just left it. He froze, feeling the first prickles of unease. The windows were shut and no wind should have reached inside. He told himself it was just the house settling. Then he saw it. Out of the corner of his eye, something moved. He whipped the flashlight toward the hallway, but there was nothing there, just shadows pooling in the corners. His heart pounded as he slowly backed away. He needed to check the upstairs bedrooms and leave. The sooner, the better. The staircase groaned under his weight as he climbed. Every step felt heavier than the last, as if something unseen resisted his movement. At the top, he paused, catching his breath. The hallway stretched before him, shrouded in darkness. He started with the first room. It was empty, except for a bed frame and an old wardrobe. He was about to turn away when he heard it, a faint whisper, just on the edge of hearing. Faison! His breath caught in his throat. Someone had said his name. He spun around, shining the flashlight wildly across the room, but nothing stirred. The sound had been close, too close. It wasn't the wind or the rain. Shaking, Faison forced himself to continue. He opened the door to the next room, the master bedroom. It was exactly as he remembered from childhood. The bed still made, the furniture draped in dust. And then he saw her. In the far corner of the room stood a figure, a woman. Her back turned to him, her long hair tangled and wet. She wore an old-fashioned nightgown that clung to her thin frame. Faison's stomach dropped. Hello? He called out, his voice cracking. The woman didn't respond. She just stood there, her shoulders rising and falling with slow, shallow breaths. Who are you? Faison whispered, gripping the flashlight tightly, his palms slick with sweat. The woman began to hum, a low, haunting tune that sent shivers crawling up his spine. Faison's instincts screamed at him to run, but his legs felt rooted to the spot. Then, with a slow, deliberate motion, the woman began to turn around. Her face was pale, gaunt, and wrong. Her eyes were hollow pits, blacker than the night outside, and her mouth stretched into an impossibly wide grin. Teeth, too sharp, too many. Faison stumbled backward, nearly dropping the flashlight. No. This isn't real, he muttered, trying to convince himself. But the woman stepped toward him, her bare feet silent on the floor. Stay, she whispered, her voice like the rustling of dead leaves. Stay with me, in the dead of night. The flashlight flickered, and for a moment, the room plunged into darkness. When the beam returned, she was gone. Faison's heart raced as he bolted from the room, 
tearing down the hallway. He leapt down the stairs two at a time, his breath ragged, every instinct screaming that he had to get out. The front door was in sight, just a few more steps, but as he reached for the handle, the house shifted around him. The walls seemed to breathe and the shadows deepened, closing in. From behind him came the sound of the woman's humming, soft and persistent, growing louder with every second. No, Faison shouted, yanking the door open and bursting into the rain-soaked night. He didn't stop running until he reached his car. Fumbling with the keys, he got the door open, slammed it shut behind him, and locked it. His hands trembled as he started the engine. Just as the car roared to life, something moved in the rearview mirror. Uh, Faison glanced up and felt his blood turn to ice. The woman was sitting in the back seat, like her black eyes gleaming with malice. You can't leave, she whispered, her grin widening. The engine sputtered and died. The car was trapped in the dead of night. Story number seven. The storm began just as Ryan pulled into the narrow dirt path leading to the old farmhouse. Rain pelted his car, battering the windows and blurring his view. Lightning forked through the sky, illuminating the sagging roof and peeling paint of the house his family had owned for generations. It had been years since Ryan had last visited, and the place looked even more abandoned than he remembered. He hadn't planned on staying the night, but with the storm raging outside, he had no other option. Inside, the air was thick with dust and decay. The power was out, so he used his flashlight to navigate, casting long shadows that seemed to shift and dance on their own. The house creaked and groaned, its old bones settling as he wandered through its rooms, memories drifting up with every step. But one room remained untouched, locked tight since he was a child, the attic. His grandfather had always forbidden him from going into the attic. It's not safe up there, he would say, his face unusually stern. When he passed away, the key to the attic had vanished, as though the old man wanted to keep whatever secrets lay up there hidden forever. Ryan shook off a shiver as he made his way to the living room and settled into an old armchair, hoping to wait out the storm. The rain hammered against the windows, and the wind howled around the house like a restless spirit. He hadn't been there long when he heard it, a faint, rhythmic thumping coming from above. It was coming from the attic. At first he thought it was just the wind, rattling something loose. But the noise persisted, steady and deliberate. Thump, thump. Ryan's heart quickened. He told himself it was probably just an animal, a raccoon or a squirrel trapped in the attic, trying to find a way out. But deep down, he knew it sounded too purposeful, too human. Unable to ignore it any longer, he decided to investigate. He grabbed his flashlight and climbed the staircase, every step echoing through the silent house. When he reached the top, he found himself standing before the attic door. Its paint cracked and peeling. The doorknob rusted from years of neglect. His hand trembled as he reached for it, his mind racing with memories of his grandfather's warnings. To his surprise, the door opened without resistance, revealing a narrow staircase leading up into the dark. The air was cold and heavy, laced with a strange metallic scent that set his nerves on edge. As he climbed the stairs, the thumping grew louder, echoing through the narrow space until it seemed to vibrate through his bones. At the top of the stairs, he entered a large, empty room. Dust coated every surface, and old, faded furniture lay scattered across the floor, as though someone had left in a hurry. But his attention was drawn to the center of the room, where a large wooden chest sat, its surface covered in strange, intricate carvings. The thumping stopped. Ryan approached the chest, his flashlight casting eerie shadows across the carvings. They were symbols he didn't recognize, twisting and turning like vines. His fingers traced the rough surface, and as he did, a chill crept over him, settling into his bones. He felt an overwhelming urge to open the chest, to see what secrets it held. But a small, frightened part of him wanted to leave, to walk away and never look back. Ignoring his fear, he knelt before the chest and lifted the lid. Inside was a single object, an old, worn-out doll with glassy, unblinking eyes. Its face was cracked and faded, its dress tattered and stained. The sight of it sent a wave of nausea through him. He remembered this doll. It had belonged to his mother as a child. She used to call it Annabelle, and she had loved it dearly, until she stopped visiting the house altogether, too terrified to set foot inside. As he reached out to touch the doll, a voice echoed through the room, soft and whispering, barely more than a breath. Ryan. He froze, 
his hand hovering over the doll. The voice was familiar, painfully so, though he hadn't heard it in years. It was his mother's voice, trembling and faint, as though calling out from a great distance. Ryan, you shouldn't be here. The flashlight flickered, casting brief glimpses of shadows that seemed to slither across the walls. He pulled his hand back, heart pounding as the voice faded. But he wasn't alone. A dark figure stood at the edge of his vision, barely more than a shadow, but unmistakably human. It was tall and gaunt, its eyes hollow and empty, watching him with an intensity that sent a jolt of terror through him. Ryan backed away, but the figure didn't move. It simply stood there, watching, as though waiting for him to make a choice. The doll lay in the chest, staring up at him with its unblinking eyes, and he felt a strange compulsion to pick it up, to take it with him. But a memory resurfaced, sharp and painful. His mother's terrified face as she'd left the house, her eyes haunted and hollow, just like the figure before him. In a sudden rush of panic, he slammed the lid shut and bolted down the stairs, the sound of his own footsteps pounding in his ears. The house seemed to close in around him, the walls pressing closer, the darkness thickening as he stumbled down the stairs and burst through the front door into the rain-soaked night. Outside, the storm had quieted, leaving only the soft patter of rain against the ground. He looked back at the house, half expecting to see the figure watching him from the attic window. But the house was dark and silent, as though it had never stirred. He drove away, the doll's hollow eyes burned into his memory, and the echo of his mother's voice lingering in his ears. Days later, he learned that his mother, who he hadn't spoken to in years, had passed away the same night he'd visited the house. Her last words, according to the nurse, had been, Tell Ryan not to go back, the house remembers. Ryan never returned to the farmhouse, and he never spoke of that night again. But sometimes in the dead of night, he would hear the faint rhythmic thumping echoing through his dreams, a reminder that some secrets are better left buried. Story number eight. Absolutely, here's a new ghost story centered around a mysterious old hotel in the dead of night. The Blackwood Inn had always been a place of intrigue. Nestled in the fog-covered hills just outside the city, it was known more for its haunting history than its comfort. The inn, a sprawling Victorian-era mansion, was rumored to have housed its fair share of spirits. Guests rarely stayed more than one night, often fleeing after strange, unexplainable encounters. But I was intrigued by the stories, and when an opportunity to stay the night arose, I couldn't resist. The innkeeper, a stooped, gray-haired woman with sunken eyes, handed me my key with a word of caution. Room 313, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. But if you hear anything in the dead of night, I suggest you stay in your bed and ignore it. Why? I asked, half smiling, hoping for a spooky anecdote. But she didn't return my grin. Just trust me, some things are better left alone. With that eerie warning, I made my way up the grand staircase, marveling at the faded wallpaper, the chandeliers coated in dust, and the portraits that lined the hallways. Each painting seemed to watch as I passed, and the old wooden floor creaked underfoot as if the very house were alive. Room 313 was tucked away at the end of a narrow corridor, and as I unlocked the door, a strange sense of dread washed over me. Inside, the room was quaint, with antique furniture and a single window looking out over the misty grounds. The bed, a four-poster with heavy velvet curtains, seemed to exude an air of antiquity, as though countless guests had lain there, all with secrets of their own. The night was uneventful until around 2.45 a.m. That's when the scratching began, a faint, almost tentative scrape as if something was moving behind the walls. I remembered the innkeeper's warning, but my curiosity got the better of me. I sat up in bed, listening, trying to pinpoint the sound. The scratching grew louder, moving from the wall beside the bed to the door. Then with a soft click, the doorknob began to turn. My heart raced and I froze, clutching the blanket. The door creaked open, slowly, and I caught a glimpse of a figure standing in the doorway, just barely illuminated by the dim light spilling in from the hallway. It was a woman. She was dressed in an old-fashioned nightgown, her hair tangled and her eyes vacant, unfocused. She drifted into the room, her bare feet silent on the hardwood floor and stopped at the edge of the bed. I wanted to call out to ask her who she was, but my voice caught in my throat. Her gaze seemed to look past me, as though she were seeing something from another time, another life. Then she whispered, her voice fragile, as though speaking hurt her. Have you seen my daughter? 
The air grew cold, and I shivered as I struggled to respond. No, I, I haven't seen anyone else here. Her expression shifted, sadness pooling in her eyes. She turned toward the window, drifting to the corner of the room, where she sank to the floor, weeping softly, her shoulders shaking. She looked so human, so heartbreakingly real, that I almost believed I could comfort her. But then, as quickly as she had appeared, she began to fade, dissolving into the shadows, uh, her outline blurring until there was nothing left but the faint scent of lavender and the heavy weight of sorrow in the room. The scratching resumed later that night, starting softly and then building until it sounded like claws raking against wood. I stayed in bed, paralyzed with fear, remembering the innkeeper's warning. As I lay there, the scratching grew closer, the sound traveling up the wall to the ceiling above my bed. My eyes were locked on the chandelier, which began to sway as though something were crawling across the beams. A soft voice broke the silence. Help me, please. The voice echoed, soft and desperate, filling the room. It was the same woman, her voice fragmented, pleading. I leapt from bed, unable to stay put any longer, and opened the door, hoping to escape. But the hallway was different, dark and narrow, the wallpaper peeling, and there was no trace of the staircase I'd climbed earlier. Panic surged through me as I turned back, but the room was empty, its air thick with dust and shadows. Suddenly, a child's laughter echoed through the hall, sweet but chilling. I turned to see a small girl at the far end of the corridor. She looked just like the woman, a ghostly pale child with tangled hair and hollow eyes, holding a small ragged doll. She stared at me, unblinking before stretching out her hand. Will you help us? She whispered, her voice hollow, the words carrying a weight of despair. In that moment, I realized that the woman's spirit wasn't searching for her daughter. She was looking for someone to free them both. Whatever had happened to them had bound their souls to the inn, trapping them in a cycle of loss and despair. I reached out, but as I moved toward her, she disappeared, her image flickering like a candle before she was gone. In the morning, I left my room, shaken and desperate for answers. The innkeeper waited for me at the foot of the stairs, her face expressionless. I stammered, trying to explain what I'd seen, but she stopped me with a knowing nod. Her name was Eleanor, she said softly. She and her daughter, Claire, lived here long ago. They say she died of heartbreak after Claire vanished one night, and they've been searching for each other ever since. Some guests hear Eleanor's calls, others see Claire. But once the clock strikes three, they're drawn back unable to escape. I left the inn that morning, the weight of their sorrow lingering long after I was gone. To this day, I don't know if they found peace or if their spirits remain trapped, endlessly searching in the dead of night, bound to the Blackwood Inn by the cruel twist of fate that separated then. Story number nine. The night was heavy with silence, broken only by the distant hoots of owls. A young man named Arif found himself walking along a desolate country road, far from the comfort of the town. His motorbike had given out miles back, leaving him no choice but to continue on foot until he reached the next village. The path was flanked by dense forest, and the moon, hidden behind layers of thick clouds, cast no light to guide him. Arif checked his phone again, no signal. A strange unease gnawed at him. He had heard stories about these woods, tales of a woman pale as a corpse who roamed the roads in search of travelers, it was said she only appeared to those who walked alone in the dead of night. He quickened his pace, hoping to leave the stories behind, but the forest seemed to grow denser with every step. The air was thick and cold, making it difficult to breathe. He shivered despite himself, zipping his jacket to ward off the chill. After what felt like hours, Arif saw a flickering light ahead. It was a small house nestled between the trees with a single lantern glowing faintly on the porch. A wave of relief washed over him, Maybe someone inside could offer help, or at least directions. He climbed the creaking wooden steps and knocked. There was no answer. He knocked again, harder this time. Still nothing. Just as he was about to give up, the door swung open on its own with a low, drawn-out creak. Hello, Arif called, stepping inside cautiously. The air was colder inside than out, as if the house hadn't been lived in for years. Yet everything seemed intact, the furniture, the framed pictures on the wall, and the faint smell of burning incense. It felt like someone had just left. He wandered into the living room. An old grandfather clock ticked steadily, though its hands were stuck at midnight. A chill ran down his spine. Midnight. 
the dead of night. As Arif turned to leave, the door behind him slammed shut with a deafening bang. The sound echoed through the house and the lantern on the porch flickered out. Panic began to rise in his chest. He ran to the door and yanked at the handle, but it wouldn't budge. It was as if the house had swallowed him whole. Then he heard it, soft footsteps from the hallway behind him. Arif froze, his breath caught in his throat. He turned slowly and there she was. A woman stood at the far end of the hall, dressed in white, her long black hair covering her face. Who? Who are you? Arif whispered, though every part of him told him to run. The woman didn't answer. She took a step forward, and Arif saw that her bare feet left wet footprints on the wooden floor. The scent of damp earth and decay filled the air. He backed away, his heart pounding. I, I just need directions, he stammered, hoping against reason that she was just a resident of this eerie house. The woman stopped for a moment, then tilted her head unnaturally, as if studying him. Her long hair shifted slightly, and Arif caught a glimpse of something horrifying, a pale, gaunt face with eyes like hollow pits. You shouldn't have come here, she whispered, her voice rasping like dead leaves blown by the wind. Arif turned and ran, bolting toward the back of the house. He flung open a door and found himself in a kitchen, cluttered with old, rusted appliances. But the woman was already there, standing by the sink, her grin wide and unnatural. She took a step toward him, her bare feet making no sound. The shadows seemed to ripple around her, stretching and writhing like they had a life of their own. Arif slammed the kitchen door shut and ran down another hall, frantically searching for a way out. Every room he entered seemed to twist and change, hallways leading back on themselves, doors opening into places he had just left. It was as if the house were alive and it didn't want him to leave. Then, in the distance, he heard a soft, melodic hum. It was the same tune his grandmother used to sing to him when he was a child. Confused but desperate, he followed the sound. Maybe it was his mind playing tricks on him, or maybe it was a way out. He didn't care, as long as it took him away from the woman. The hum led him to a small door at the end of a narrow corridor. He flung it open and found himself standing in a room filled with mirrors. Hundreds of reflections stared back at him, each one his, but somehow wrong. In the mirrors, his reflections smiled when he didn't, blinked when he stood still, and in every reflection, just behind him, stood the woman, grinning. Let me go. Let me go, Arif screamed, spinning around, but the room was empty. His reflection, however, began to move without him. In the mirror, the woman placed her hand on his shoulder, and his reflection whispered, She's already inside. Arif stumbled backward, horrified. The room began to close in around him, the mirrors warping and twisting, trapping him in a maze of glass. Then he felt it, a cold hand on his shoulder. He turned, and there she was, her grin wider than before, her hollow eyes drinking in his fear. Stay with me, she whispered. It's always night here. Arif tried to scream, but the sound was swallowed by the darkness. The mirrors shattered all at once, and the world folded into nothingness. The next morning, a passing driver found Arif's motorbike abandoned on the road, but there was no sign of him. Only the locals knew the truth. Those who wandered into the woods at night never returned. Some say they still hear his voice in the dead of night, calling out for help, trapped in a place where dawn never comes.